Broadcasting to you wonderful people that are not here in Las Vegas with us at Nikon Live or our Facebook page. Welcome those of you that are here in the seats and in the booth. Anyone here in Nikon booth, come up and grab a seat. We're going to start uh, another program, and it's something a little bit different. Um, we're all inspired to take pictures, and I know there are so many devices out there, cell phones, smartphones that you can start taking pictures with. And you don't have to want to have a career in photography to think about taking the next steps to become one. Just having that passion fueled by starting to take pictures with any device, I think brings a passion out in some that makes them want to graduate and step up. So we thought it'd be a great idea amongst all this technology, and we can talk to you about the technology and the cameras out at the tables, but talk about how you get started in photography and how you start to move up and become a professional if that's what you want to do. Or have photography in your life as a passion, but you grow with your photography and become better based on who you're looking at or your ideas or your thoughts. So let me get started by introducing the panel. I have not, but I met most uh, two of these people just today in person for the first time, but I've been looking at their work and I'm fascinated by the landscape work and the fine art work that they do. Let me introduce to the Nikon Theater stage, first, Taylor Gray. He does amazing landscape work, and I can't wait to talk to him about what Thank drives you. him. Nice to see you. You can sit there. This next lady I've now known for several years. Um, she came into my world because somebody told me to look at her Instagram page. Now, as a manager of pro relations for Nikon, and I have been with Nikon 35 years, I have to look at the work of a lot of photographers, a lot of wedding photographers when we're looking at, you know, trying to, to partner up or create relationships with wedding people. And when I saw Kaya Marie Stone's work, the first thing I thought was, wow, it's fresh, it's clean. It makes me want to look at the next picture. So let me introduce the Nikon stage, Kaya Marie Stone. Hey. Thank you. And this next artist, and I call him an artist because that is what he is, is so different than I am in the way I shoot and the way I think. Because he actually puts pictures together in his head, and then he takes that vision and he brings it to his photography. Let me introduce Nicholas Bruno. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> All the people clapping at home, they're louder than you guys. Um, no, this is good. So, wow, guys, we're here. <laughs> we are here. You are uh, the seventh of ten panels, maybe the eighth of ten panels, so we're doing pretty good. Um, and it's important, those guys, if you don't know, um, the programs that we have and we've been recording here are on uh, Nikon Live, and they'll be up there. So if you missed anything or you missed any part of this program, uh, you can go back and watch them uh, as often as you want on Nikon USA, Nikon Live. Uh, I want to get started because I had to start somewhere with you guys in learning who you are, did a little bit of reading, followed your Instagram pages. But uh, Taylor, let's start with you. Tell everybody, when you got started in photography, what was it that pushed you over the edge to get real serious about this, and where you think you're kind of moving and going from now? Sure. Uh, I got started in photography when I was 14 years old. <clears throat> I took my uh, dad's Nikon D5100 at the time on a two-week backpacking trip through the Colorado Rockies. And in the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just taking, you know, mindless snapshots, uh, just fooling around with this expensive piece of equipment. Um, but it was after the trip that photography really started to intrigue me. And I picked up the camera again and began trying to research as much as I could about the craft. And I would come home, like, every day after school and would really just try to perfect the craft, watch countless YouTube tutorials and uh, read up on different articles on how to take better photographs. And from there, um, I started posting my work online and uh, met up with a huge community of photographers, um, not only online but in person in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I learned so much from them as well and really just incredible community of people. And from there, I am now um, uh, studying business marketing at Oregon State University. Um, as a junior, and um, I do uh, different freelance work for both photography and videography, um, and I really just enjoy the craft and enjoy Nikon. See, that's, that's pretty amazing, and you know, again, I'm going to try and balance this with a lot of thoughts. I think one of the biggest advantages today is that you have the opportunity to go to YouTube and some of these other channels. Back in my day, it was either talk to a photographer on the phone or go to the library and look at the books. 
you know, books became more of that valuable asset to us, but it's so great to have that technology where you can see so many different pictures. Uh, Kaya Marie, had, tell everybody about how you got into photography and how you progressed. And just so you guys know, uh, Kaya Marie is one of Nikon's top 100 photographers, part of a contest that we had, and she was selected as top 100, and her work is just, to me, is brilliant. So, can you hear me? Sorry. So you remember in high school there was always that one yearbook nerd that took everybody's picture? That, that was me. <laughs> um, and when I got older, I was looking on Craigslist and there was an ad about uh, a couple that wanted their wedding shot. Right. They only had a budget of $300. Um, so my mom took all the money she had. She bought me a D90 because that's what our local camera store told her was the best professional body to get into weddings. I had no idea what I was doing. I shot the wedding in auto because I wasn't a professional photographer at the time. I didn't know manual or aperture priority. Um, I did a, an okay job, but what happened was I delivered those, the pictures to the couple and they loved them. And I can't even tell you the rush that I felt for making other people happy. Like, making people happy made me happy. So I was like, I have to be a professional. I don't care what it takes. So what I did was, I actually started following Jerry. And- um, Jerry Guionis. Yes. Mm -hmm. On um, all the social media channels that I could. He also had a free thing once in a while on YouTube, um, Ice Society. And um, I started looking on Instagram, Facebook, wherever I could at professional photographers whose style I wanted to emulate. I knew I wanted a bright, clean, light, airy, like overall no shadows or anything like that in my image. And I just started following all the people I loved and I took my D90 and I shot as much as I could and I worked my way through that's, that's where amazing. I am now. I, I'm watching these pictures go through and Nicholas, I see a mind in there that is just <laughs> ridiculously creative. When did you first pick up a camera, and how did you know that this is something that you would love to do? So my first experience picking up a camera, I had to have been six years old, seven years old. My mom used to buy me those little point and shoots you buy from CVS or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, and you get them developed. So I would start there. I'd take a bunch of pictures, random stuff. She would print them for me. I'd be so excited. So that happened. Then it kind of disappeared for me. And then in high school, I started struggling sort of with depression and this thing called sleep paralysis that I have. Mm -hmm. It's a condition where I fall asleep, I wake up, and I'm frozen in my bed, and I start to dream while I'm awake, and I see all these terrifying things like figures walking through my room, or the, the scenery will start to shake, or I'll feel like pressure on my chest. Wow. So I was struggling really hard in school, but my one outlet was my photography class that I started taking. So what I started doing was maybe sketching out some ideas. I talked to my teacher. I started keeping a dream journal. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why don't, you, why don't you start making these little sketches into something that's in your photo work? Why don't you mm -hmm. create these characters in real life and, and experiment with that? Right. So from there, I started taking my stresses, all the horrible things that I would see and feel, and turning them into a therapeutic process. That's amazing. Huh? Make an old guy feel good. Tell me you guys have shot a roll of film at I, least once. I still shoot film. You know that, Mike. <laughs> I do. I have I an F135 millimeter that's actually back at my Airbnb. I still shoot film. So, Taylor, I want to come back to you. Um, you have some amazing nature work that I've seen. Uh, those of you who don't know, we, we used to have a, um, a, a web website that we now rolled into Nikon Learn and Explore, and uh, you did an article. Talk a little bit about what really draws you to nature and, and that passion that comes out in it and, and how you approach this. Sure. Uh, so before I got into photography, I've always been uh, into uh, the na in nature and hiking. And I was a Boy Scout, actually, for as long as I can remember, always surrounded by uh, the wilderness and the outdoors. And um, it wasn't actually until I was able to really pick up a camera that I could really connect with the environment um, in a different way. I think photography really opened my eyes to uh, the way I see the world and allowed me to gain just really this better appreciation for uh, uh, not only the environment, but uh, the wildlife and um, the different things that go into uh, preserving that. Um, everything around that really just revolves around uh, picking up a camera and taking photographs 
of what I saw in nature. Um, Nicholas, you opened up the door to something very personal, and thank you for doing that. Um, that's a pretty brave thing to do. Um, talk about, I mean, as your pictures start to roll through, um, I know we're seeing alternately the other photographers, but how, you, you, you have these dreams, you wake up. How do you start to piece that together in a photograph? How do you bring it to that two-dimensional form of the photograph? So my process is kind of multimedia, where it begins as maybe some writing or a sketch from my dream journal. And from there, I'll be create maybe a finer sketch of the points that I want to hit on, maybe whatever the mood is, maybe the colors I want to use, maybe a, a symbol, a dream symbol that I can incorporate either by making it or finding it in my environments that I explore. And from there, I go to my location. I'll scout out my locations. Normally, they're near me on Long Island in New York. Um, I'll look for like murky marshlands, different ways to use symbolism as to what I feel in the dreams, like being like sucked under or drowning. I use a lot of water in my work where my characters are I see that. Yeah, they're halfway yep. like submerged and they're trying to come out of the water and there's these figures that have like cloaks over their faces. Um, so from there, once I find my location, I'll begin building my props, whether it be through woodworking, metalworking, and then I'll go out to the set, like the, to the location where I'll be, and I'll model for most of my shots, and I'll do multiple exposures right. where I'm moving, I'm changing costumes, I'm moving characters around. Like, for example, these are all me. Like, I'm chasing myself while I'm tied to this so that's chair. A multiple exposure. It's a multiple exposure. So right. I kind of play along that dialogue of <laughs> these dreams are coming from my own head, so I can become these characters that also torment me because they all come from here. Right. That's, uh, that's pretty wild. Kaya Marie, one yeah. of the things I mentioned before, and what I love about your work, it's so clean. It's yeah. so fresh, but you also have a connection, emotional and passion, you know, right. that you bring to the photography. We've talked about this before. Talk to us a little bit more about the depth of your photos, and it's not just people in portraits. It goes far, much further than that, right? right. More than well, weddings. I love nature, people, and anything that's outside. So it, whether it be um, a tree, grass, wildlife, I just feel like our life is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Recently, I lost my mom, and she didn't have the appreciation for life that she probably should have. And when I take on a new couple, the very first thing I do is I ask them what their story is, because I want to connect with them. I want to know, are they getting married on a farm? I want to know how they met. I want to know everything about them, every little detail, because I want to make sure that their passion and their beauty will connect with the story that I'm going to tell for them. Right. So every one of my pictures, like you'll never see pictures with architecture or um, buildings or deep contrast or shadows, because we're just in such a beautiful, bright, joyful world. And if everyone just stops like, just being cruel to each other and mean to each other, you would just look around and just see the beauty of nature, the beauty of flor flowers. Like Every spring, we have flowers and blooms, and life just renews. April so, showers yeah. bring May flowers. So that's when I'm taking my images, I always show every detail, every color. Um, whether the sun is coming from the side or if I'm backlighting my couple, I take into account every aspect that, I'm, that, that God has given me. And it's just because I don't see like dark, dreary, rainy. I never see like the, the glass is half empty. Like just, I always see the joy in everything. And that's, I, that's just how I bring it out in my photos. Mm -hmm. So Taylor, uh, in, in the nature work, in the landscape, wildlife you do, where are you going? Where are your favorite places to go? Where do you, you know, you say you're still in school, right? And yes, I, right. Do, do you look at uh, this as a profession that you're going to get into? First, let me ask you that. Uh, are you going to move on and make this a career, or are you just going to keep uh, this fun? That is the dream, yes. I would love to be doing this professionally. Involving photography, videography, and tra travel is definitely something I'm aspiring to do. And some of my favorite locations, um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and one of my favorite locations that I will still always go back to um, for inspiration today is Yosemite National Park. Um, I still so clearly remember my first time there. Uh, it seemed like there was a photo opportunity waiting for me around every corner. Um, really just an amazing place. Um, more recently, uh, I, will, I went on a uh, five-week trip to Alaska. A friend and I drove up there. 
Yes, drove up there for 52 hours on the open road. That is um, dedication and passion. Yeah. Carry that with you, because if you are getting in a career, you're going to need that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and our sole purpose was there to take pictures. Mm -hmm. um, no job or anything like that. We just wanted to get out and explore uh, a new territory. Um, and I really think it's visiting new places uh, that really just draw the most inspiration and creativity from me. Um, and having no expectations about what you're going to shoot. Sometimes it's good to have an expectation of sure. what you want to shoot um, in your head, and you, want, you have a goal towards capturing a specific image. But I found some of my most unique images uh, stemmed from just going to a place, uh, especially a new area, with no expectations or um, anything like that uh, for capturing something I, I've seen online or anything like that. But having, having this, this fresh perspective um, really allows your creativity come out and you can create some very unique compositions. That's very true. So Nicholas, you talked about multiple exposures, so you're using technology within the cameras. Um, how much of what you do has to happen in post-production uh, in the computer? So I try to keep my process as minimal as possible because I'm in the world of surrealism and people automatically want to pick apart photoshopped images. They want to piece together, see what they did. Um, so I've kind of refined the way I shoot where everything has to happen in front of the camera right. and my camera's staying on a tripod and I'm on, the, on my D810 I have the uh, interval timer. Right. So that interval timer is like my lifesaver because what right. I can do is I can load in a blank card, stick that in there, and then set that timer on for three seconds, four seconds, and I can go out and model for my, for my shoots. I can become multiple characters. I can shift my, my props, whether it be going out into the field and using a smoke bomb to get like fog in the area. Everything has to happen right there. And then when everything right. gets unified back together in post, I'm able to layer them on top of each other, do a very nice, clean edit, and everything's true to life and not messed with. And for anybody that doesn't do a lot of post-production or editing, how long did it take you to start to hone in on the skills or the skill set? Man, I started Photoshop when I was in middle school. That's, that's where I really kind of got interested in it. So, I mean, I've been working on it for probably seven, eight years. Right. And then that, to me, it's, it's so important to just refine your skill with your camera so you don't have to do as much work in right. post. Mm -hmm. I want to shift the gears a little bit and start to get into the equipment that you use. Um, Kai and Marie, I'm going to start with you. I, I see so many different looks from the way you shoot, so I'm thinking you're using quite a few lenses. What yeah. lenses do you like? What are your favorites? And how do you approach the subject in the way of focal length or the type of lens you use? Right, so my favorite, favorite, favorite lens is my 105 because I have a lot of bridal prep, which means I'm shooting small details like rings, um, invitations, something blue, something borrowed. So the 105 is great as a macro lens. But then it's also amazing as a portrait lens. Right. A lot of people don't give that lens a lot of credit, but that 105 is super versatile. So that, that's my favorite. My second is my 85. And then my third is my nifty 50. Like, you can't go wrong with that. Literally, if all my other lenses failed, I could shoot the whole entire day with the 50. With the 50 mm Yeah, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm telling you. I could do details, my couples, the bridal party, the whole entire reception, and a partridge and a pear tree with my 50. So no zoom lenses for you? You're a fixed focal length gal. My, yeah, so I, I always shoot with the prime lens because it just gives me such a creamy, soft, blurred background. Um, my sweet spot's like 3.2, 3.5. Mm -hmm. Unless I have family or a bridal party and it's a bigger, um, I have a, a bigger number of people, then I'll go up to 4.0 or 4.5. Um, but for the most point, I'm at 2.8, 3.2, 3.5 mm -hmm. with my 105, my 85, and my 50. Now, if I really, 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 really didn't have any of those, then my next one would be my 35. Right. But I don't, I don't, I don't really need a, a, a range like a 24 to 70 or a 7200. Right. Because my subjects are for the most part right in front of me. The only time I need to have the 7200, which I do have, I right. love that lens, mm -hmm. is at the ceremony where sure. there's distance between myself and my couple up at the altar. Um, but if you guys have not shot prime lenses with that fixed focal length, you should do it. Then the core glass is like amazing and there's nothing like it once you put it, you mount it onto your body. And then I just started shooting with the Z7. Right. And that's just been a game changer for me because it's lightweight, it's amazing in low light, mm -hmm. and it's fast. 
And this, I know I keep going on, I'm sorry. <laughs> the screen. It's okay. The, screen, the little monitor screen comes out. Right. So when I want to do an aerial shot, just with my arms over the dance floor of everyone at the reception, I pull this, I pop the screen out, I face it down towards me, and now all my. my that becomes a great. Yeah, tool my camera's to work up here, with, right. but I can now still see what I'm shooting. So that Z7 has been a game changer. Right. Um, my next would be my D4. Right. I can't get, I just can't let that one go. <laughs> That's my baby. Um, but yeah, those are my lenses and bodies. So you decide you're going to pack up, you're going to drive 52 hours to Alaska. <laughs> you can't leave anything behind. What lenses are you bringing in your bag for those that are getting into nature photography? So, uh, prime lenses are always going to be very sharp, but often in landscape photography, you need to be versatile. Um, and uh, one lens I really enjoy is the 28 to 300 millimeter uh, f4.56, and that lens is great because it is just a kick-ass lens for its price. I mean, uh, very versatile. You have wide angle, you have telephoto, and I have found it is sharp all the way throughout any focal length. Um, another go-to lens is my 14 to 24 f2.8, especially during night photography. For night shoots, uh, it's so fast, and you can really uh, open up the aperture to allow a ton of light in at that f2.8. And it's so sharp. Um, I mean, it, it's a very coveted lens, um, and it remains so today. I know uh, there are other competitor companies that people use different gear, and they actually use that lens on their camera bodies. Um, really fantastic. And then, of course, for intimate details um, in uh, landscapes, uh, I like to use the 70 to 200 f2.8 uh, to really capture either wildlife or to zoom in on uh, a scene of plants in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically having a lens for a wide angle for telephoto and then having that 28 to 300 for everything in between is really my go-to workflow for shooting different variety of stuff in landscapes. Right. You know, I want to mention too, I should have said this before, Nikon has a section of the website, I may not have defined it, called Learn and Explore. Um, um, we, you first came to us with an article on a different site that we had called Chasing Light, and then we moved that over to Learn and Explore. Nicholas, if you want to see an article that he's done, you have one on Learn and Explore as well. But uh, same question to you is, when you're putting together these, uh, these images and multiple exposures and the things you're going to put together, are you using one lens to do that or do you use several lenses to do that? So I'm strictly 50 millimeter, 1.4. for That's it. <laughs> and Simple bag, light yeah. bag, that's it, end of story. Because, I mean, I'm carrying like wood, wooden props, ladders, things like that, and I want to keep my gear bag as small as possible. And for me, a, a tip to fine art photographers that are maybe making surreal conceptual artworks, a way to streamline your the presentation of your portfolio is to have a constant which would be your focal length of your lens and right. I think it's, it's very important to work within that restriction especially when you're first starting I mean I started with a Nikon D60 and a kit lens so that's what I, all I had that's all I could do so from there I'm like what can I do with my restriction and still make killer work so that forces you to be creative. It just forces you. And you, you give yourself a little bit of a, a box to stay in, but, and it allows you to break some rules and try different things. But right. I think it's important to work within your parameters and then try to make extravagant work with what you've got. That's amazing. But like, I, the 50 is amazing. Yeah, right? it's like, just it's the just best lens the, ever. Like, that's the <laughs> lens you use for everything. You're so right. <laughs> um, it's interesting in my age at 56 how different things were when so I was young. started. Um, there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook, there were no social media platforms. We, <laughs> the first computer I ever had, we called the Trash 80. It was from Radio Shack Model 100 and it made this little line of digital you know, characters and things uh, like that. Isn't Radio Shack out of business? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> All right. If you know a Radio Shack, anyway. Um, <laughs> you guys are born into to, to, to computers. You're born into you know, the technology. You're born into social. Um, I want each of you, start with you, Kaya Marie, especially since you are now a businesswoman trying to make a living, how important is social to you and how much, how frequent are you on social pages and where do you go for your social? So, there's so many social media platforms, pick two. My two are Instagram and Facebook. Put all your energy into those two. I legitimately get two to three inquiries a day, a day on my Instagram for couples wanting to book 2020, 2021, 
future weddings because I consistently post breakfast, lunch, dinner. Mm -hmm. Every day I post breakfast, lunch, dinner. Because when you're sitting and you're eating, you're scrolling through your feeds. So if you're doing that, everybody else is doing that, right? I do see your pictures come up all the time. Yeah, I see yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, for me, Instagram and Facebook are huge. I cater to each one different. I know my Instagram following is a lot younger than my Facebook following. Mm -hmm. So even though I may post the same picture on, on two different platforms, my captions are always different, but I make sure I tag everyone in the picture from my clients to their bridal party, to their family, to I use their wedding hashtag. I, um, ha I also uh, tag the vendors who are involved, which is the florist, the DJ, the venue, because now every time somebody searches a hashtag for that venue that they're looking to get married at, my pictures are gonna come up. That florist that they wanna use, my pictures are gonna come up. And anyone in their bridal party of the wedding that I shot, they're looking for a New Jersey wedding photographer, my pictures are gonna come up. So social media for me is completely the bread and butter. Now don't get me wrong, word of mouth is still great, but Instagram and Facebook is where most of my money comes in and I spend zero dollars on advertising. That's a big thing. Yeah, right? I don't spend it's any money. It's almost like you can almost own every aspect of your business, yep. you know, and message. And I make, and I'm not even kidding. I that. just, when I was in route here, I had a bride book her wedding for 2021. She PayPal'd me her deposit. I saw a purse last night in Caesars in the forum shops. I'm leaving here and going and get it because I was posting on Instagram a picture from a wedding we did uh, two months ago. She's getting married at that venue. She saw it, she loved it. Now I have another couple. Yeah. So Instagram for me and Facebook, just pick two and put all of your efforts into those two. And I'm telling you, they will pay you back more than anything you could invest in. So Taylor, you're not in business right now, right? Or are you are you running a business or? Uh, yes. And 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 delve into your social handles and I mean obviously we we post these up so you guys can follow everybody here. But um, talk about how important social is to you. Sure, um, I'd say that I found the most success on Instagram. Um, I started early and just post posting every day uh, really helps engage with not your only your followers but other people in the Instagram community. There is a huge community of photographers that is on Instagram, especially in the landscape and travel world. Um, that's where some of my biggest inspirations come from and also some of my best friends, best photographer friends I have met through Instagram. So it's really an incredible community of photographers. And from a business aspect, um, most of my work actually comes through Instagram and social media. Um, I do have a Facebook, but uh, I tend to stick with Instagram more, more because I have a larger following and I uh, haven't really had much luck with Facebook engagement, but I'm sure... Facebook is a bit different than it's, Instagram it's a bit in that different. way, sure. Um, Algorithms I think Instagram, and like uh, Kia Marie said, a much younger audience, and uh, I'm hoping that my photos inspire young people to get out and travel um, and see these beautiful places. You know, Nicholas, again, I, 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 we just met, right? This, this is not a, you know, we haven't, we, we spoke on the phone, but we haven't really gotten to know each other. So I'm, I'm so fascinated by how you build your photos and what you do. Um, what is your purpose for going to Instagram or your social uh, media pages? And, you know, wh what are you driving? What are you trying to accomplish by doing that? So I've always been on social media. I mean, I grew up in the kind of renaissance of it where MySpace was a thing and then Facebook evolved into it. So I've been sharing my artwork on Facebook since I guess when it took off. And from there, I joined Flickr and Tumblr, which were big communities for people who just loved art in general. Right. And I felt that it was great to reach out to people who are maybe in different mediums because I can help out my friend who's a journalist and he can write an article about my, my photos or something like that. Or so maybe a network. Yeah, it's more of a network. So what I did was I created a grassroots sort of foundation where these smaller blogs or whoever it was could share my work and I could share theirs back and we grew together. And from there, that's where I got picked up for video interviews, different things like that. And I'm able to share my sleep paralysis photo series with people who need it now because I have a platform to share the work, ex express what the, the condition is, how many people are actually suffering from it. They'll, they'll reach out to me, kind of help them do photos like mine or do different ways of, of being in art and using it as a therapy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But now I'm mostly sticking to Facebook and Instagram for my work. Just like she said, 
Yeah. Just st stick to two platforms. Just two. There's too many. Facebook offers a versatility of a lot of writing. You can put your writing and stuff like that. But Instagram is very streamlined. You can showcase your photos. It's it's meant for it. Like just go out, do there, do that, and share your work with the world. Right. We met uh, on Facebook. Huh? We met on. We Facebook. met on Facebook. <laughs> yes. I I I've been doing this for almost 40 years, taking pictures. And I still feel like there's so much to learn yeah. as we transition into technologies. Um, talk to me a little bit, uh, Taylor, start with you. Where, where, I know you mentioned YouTube and all this. How important is education to you moving forward? But who are some of the people that you follow and are inspired by? Sure. <clears throat> um, I'd say when I first start out, one of my biggest um, uh, inspirations in landscape photography uh, was uh, Michael Shainblum, who is not only a master at compositional uh, uh, in the field, but also post-production. And uh, the post-production skills is um, a, a huge, huge part of not la only landscape photography, but um, as far as any, any photography that you really uh, are doing. And um, I bought a tutorial from Michael Shainblum, and this was on uh, night photography, and it really just opened up my eyes to what you can do. Uh, very incredible. And there are a number of other landscape photographers out there. I see new inspiration um, every day, especially on social media, that um, I haven't met any of these people before, but their pictures are just inspiring, and I love um, engaging with uh, the community of photographers uh, on social media as well. I would, I would also throw out there, we, we have three landscape photographers that are going to be speaking for us tomorrow. Um, and, and we're going to have a panel on this, but Mandy Lee and we have Mike Mezuel and Josh Cripps. And I follow their work. And again, it's just not my thing, but I am fascinated by it. And I just love looking at their pictures. And I live vicariously through their travels. So Nicholas, uh, I'm going to toss it to you. Fine art photography is very specialized, especially the way you do it. Who are you looking to for inspiration and, and what are you searching the web for uh, in, in the way of the artists that, uh, that you follow? So I'm a big adv advocate for looking at different mediums for inspiration. Um, I'm looking at sculptors, painters, a lot of artists from the past, like 19th century painters, where they That's really cool. they broke a lot of uh, barriers where colors are being used that weren't normally used, and like subject matter, such as Casper uh, David Friedrich is one of my favorite painters, so I like his use of silhouetted figures and stuff like that. Um, f as far as photographers go, I'm looking at like Joel Robison, Brooke Shaden, um, trying to think who else would be cool. For, for Nikon, it would be Keith Wazinski. Mm, Keith. He, 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 he Keith just, is unique. Yeah, he's got some. I like his. his Mike Corrado's not in that mix. Maybe. <laughs> so sad. Maybe when I'm playing drums. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for his work, I just like how he goes out, gets it, goes in the craziest of weathering conditions. Because I'm I'm out there too in the rain. I cover my camera with a plastic bag and mm -hmm. hope I get a great shot. And I think it's just important, no matter where you are in the world, if you're in your own backyard, you can create an amazing image. And I think that's what's great about photography. Very cool. So. Kaya Marie, wedding, portrait, who are you looking at, who are you you're chasing hate down? You're going to my answer. Huh? <laughs> you're going to hate my answer. No, I'm not. Um, so I actually stopped following people who shoot in the same style as I do uh, because I started to compare myself to them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And I, I, I lost my mom and I happened to meet Jen, who's actually sitting in the audience. When you say Jen, Jen who? Was, uh, our ambassador, Jen Rosenbaum, um, who had suffered from cancer. And I had just lost my mom from cancer. And I was reading just everything she was writing. And I, it touched me in a way that I can't even explain. I hadn't met her personally. I just met her in the social world. Um, and what I did was I started following photographers who inspire me to be better. Not to make my wedding pictures better, to make me a better person. So Jen is one. I follow Jerry because he absolutely loves people. When and you say I love Jerry, Jerry, let's Dionis. assume not everybody knows who Jerry, Jerry Dionis is. Back in the back, our, our beautiful Jerry ambassador. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> I follow Chrissy Odom, who's sitting right next to him because I absolutely love wildlife, and she connects with animals in a way that I can't even put into words. She inspires my heart, like to the core. And then I also follow 
Michael Carrado. For <laughs> I was hoping somebody would say that. <laughs> because I saw you speak at WPPI, and you brought me to tears when I was sitting in the crowd when you were speaking about all the children who you were shooting at the Ronald McDonald House. Thank you. And I knew then that I had to stop comparing myself to other photographers. Everything that was in my feed was weddings, 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 weddings. And I said, I have to stop doing that. So now everything that's in my feed is inspirational, is emotional, is inspiring, is driving me to be a better person. So I don't follow, although, although Jerry Gionis is a wedding photographer like I am, I don't follow him for weddings. I follow him because of his love for weddings. Mm -hmm. So I don't follow any other people in my field, but I follow photographers who just make me want to be a better person. So um, we're starting to wind this down. These conversations go so fast and it just <laughs> blows my mind. Taylor, where do you go from here? Where's your next 52, you know, hour trip? Where's your bucket list? I mean, if, you, if you've started a bucket list, my age, that's typically when you do it. But where, where is the coolest place you want to go that you haven't been to yet? I would say, um, well, I just wrapped up a trip to Europe and ended in uh, Italy. Uh, around the, the urban areas, but I'd say the Italian Dolomites are just some of the most inspiring places I've seen. I would love to go on a backpacking trip. I'm an avid backpacker and hiker, and uh, would love to go on a backpacking trip um, through the Dolomites. It would be amazing. Um, basically, any mountain environment is really where uh, I just make my most favorite photos. Um, whether even the, I live in Seattle now, so the Alpine Lakes Wilderness is just a few hours drive away, and I have not even been out there yet. So making photos in the wilderness is just part of what really makes me happy as a photographer and where I produce some of my absolute all-time favorite images. Um, it's hopefully, uh, eventually one day I want to get into um, uh, alpine hiking and uh, right. uh, mountain climbing. Uh, I look up to photographers like uh, in videographies like Corey Rich here who started out as a climber and uh, really just amazing work um, and I'd say overall just anything in nature anything in the wilderness where I feel like it is untouched just places that are still truly wild are just really just get my gears turning and um, I love it I love Very it cool. um, Nicholas your, your mind takes you anywhere you want to go, and I think that's pretty brilliant. For anyone that's looking to get into fine art the way you do it, what tips would you have for someone who wants to get started in, in that kind of fine art photography? I would say dip into your own personal experiences and grab your camera, whatever you have, whether it's your phone, whether it's your, your mom's camera, your new camera that you, that you spent all your money on. <laughs> go out there in your backyard, set up a little scene with your friend and just experiment. Try different things, keep a notebook, write down different symbols and uh, use them in a way that kind of defines your own work. You don't have to have the most expensive camera and all these different lenses to make impeccable work and you don't have to have the budget to fly to, to like the northernmost region of Canada. You could just go to your friend's backyard or maybe your local park use the shallow depth of field so you can blur out that background, not make it look like you're somewhere that's maybe suburbs, right. and just go crazy. And eventually, you'll create a style for yourself that's uniquely you. So Kaya Marie, anybody that's looking to get into wedding photography or trying to run a wedding business, how would they get started? What would your advice be to them if they want to take the next step? So I'm actually going to talk about that in my chat right after this. Um, styled shoots. If you don't know what that is, it's just where you put together a, a sh uh, shoot yourself. You get a couple, you get a florist involved, uh, a tuxedo place, a bridal salon for a wedding dress, and you do a shoot that you've organized, um, you've picked out all the details, you shoot the photos, and then you can post that. You have content to post. If not, there's always somebody getting married. There's always somebody who doesn't have a budget for a wedding. Just keep your ears open. You see friends on Facebook on their feed, you know, hey, looking for a wedding photographer. Offer yourself. Tell them you're in no way, shape, or form professional, but this is what you could do. Show them your portfolio of what you have shot. Be very honest with them because there are some people that are going to say yes to you and, and hire you. And although you're not going to be making top dollar, you're going to be getting paid for the work that you're going to produce at that time. 
So just keep your ears open, uh, your eyes open, and if not, do your own shoot, post it, put it out there, put it out there in the social world, and people will pick up on it. Use the hashtags, people will see it. And then just charge accordingly. You can't jump into it and expect you're gonna get five or $6,000 for your very first wedding. You need to be you know, a few weddings in before you can command those prices. Very but definitely use your social mediums and just friends, friends of family, family, anyone that you know of. Well, I, I can't tell you that of all the panel discussion we've done, I, this is the most fascinating to me, believe it or not. And yeah. So what we're gonna do now, um, gentlemen, we're gonna vacate the stage. We're gonna push the chairs to the side um, and we're gonna okay. make a, a, a slow transition into your program. You're gonna speak for 30 minutes. What's your title? Um, it's um, Be Consistent, Build Your Brand. So something that I just had it a pretty hard time with when I first started out. But I think I'm better with it now, so I'm gonna talk about it for you guys. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Taylor Gray, Kaya Marie Stone, Nicholas Bruno, thank you guys so much for opening up to us. We're gonna make a quick transition on the stage, and uh, Kaya Marie's gonna take it from here.